Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We are in the third chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Luke the theologian, Luke the historian, but most commonly known to us as Luke the physician. We get to this third chapter and once again we see Luke the historian come to the fore. Once again, we are given within the first two verses a historical context for us to bear in mind, as he said from the beginning in the first chapter, in the fourth verse, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. There is a reason why Luke grounds this chapter as he did the first chapter, giving us relevant historical information. And it is that you may have certainty concerning what you have been taught. You have been taught that Christ was born at a specific point in time and at a specific area in the world And the information that we find in the Bible and even the names as we've discussed in Passovers before give us this reality over and over again. The number of Johns, the number of Marys. Remember the procession of Marys going to anoint the body of Christ? All of that was an absolute historical reality. If you went and you looked and you can look at the documents of the most popular names were within the time of the birth of Christ, you will find that Miriam was one of the most popular names, as was John and Judas. And what do we find? Several Johns, several Judases. There's even a Judas that has to make sure that he's careful to say, Hi, I'm Judas, not Iscariot, by the way. And we have a whole plethora of Marys. All of these were there, and it's a verifiable historical fact. Again, why is this there? So that you can have certainty concerning what you have been taught. So that you can have the certainty to say, hey, you know what? I don't believe in a myth. I don't believe in a fable, as Peter said in 2 Peter. We do not follow cleverly devised myths. We believe in the one true and living God who worked out these truths in time, in space, for His glory and for our salvation. And so when we turn to verses 1 through 6, I want us to bear this in mind, and that both the historical realities that are present here and the focus on repentance are important. The title of this morning's message is Preparing a Way, or Preparing the Way for the Lord. And that's kind of a play on words in the fact that not only are we going to see John the Baptist doing that exercise and preparing the way for the Lord when he did as a fulfillment of the scriptures, but it's also a call to action for us to prepare the way for the Lord in our families, to prepare the way for the Lord in our community, to prepare the way for the Lord within these United States of America, to prepare the way for the Lord in the planet that belongs to him upon which he already has all authority and dominion. So, without further ado, let's read Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you would please rise for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is God's inerrant, infallible, and holy word. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother, Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and... Caiaphas, the word of God, came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book 
of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is the guiding light, the solid ground beneath our feet, the very instruction manual for how we are to live every moment of every day. Father, as we seek imperfectly to go after righteousness and holiness, Father, we pray that you help us to understand more and more of your word, that we be given eyes that see your word and ears that hear your word, that we be able to engrave, Father, within our minds and within our hearts the truth of your word, that we might not sin against you, that we be able to live these truths out, Father. We pray this morning that you be glorified, that you, Father, be presented as true within this congregation and within the video that will record these words. Father, we humbly ask these things in the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. There is a plethora of information here. We have names, we have places and locations, and we have the quoting of scripture. I want you to see and note that there is terrestrial powers and there is religious powers both presented within the first few verses. And then there is the location from which John the Baptist was called, which is the wilderness, and there is the message the instruction that is given to the people of God in fulfillment. All of these things are important for us to bear in mind. So we begin in verses 1 and 2, right, as we look at this transition in this gospel narrative, as we finally get the introduction, not of baby John the Baptist, or not of just born John the Baptist, but of John the Baptist in action, right? The forerunner of Christ. What was the environment like? And we've talked about this several times over because it is an important reality that Luke is presenting to us. The ambiance, the environment, the backdrop is dark. It is dark as you see the political landscape, and it is dark as you see the religious landscape of the people of God at this time. It's absolute pitch black darkness that helps us to see all the more clearly what John, not the Baptist, John the Apostle, wrote when talking about the light of the world coming into the darkness and being rejected by that darkness. This is all important. He is there, John the Baptist is showing there, and we've talked about John the Baptist and how absolutely critical and important he was, how there were people that believed what he said, and how those people were God-fearers and Jews alike. We know that those men that are going to come to John sent by the Pharisees and the Sadducees are only going to him because they are trying to figure out how this man is going to impact their little kingdom that they have built up in the theology of men according to customs and traditions that they have built up for themselves rather than following in obedience of God. It's, it's a reminder of God's redemptive work because that's what we're seeing start unfold, not in some made-up story, not in a mythos, but in real, actual, factual events and places 
with people that existed. We have to remember that we don't just take a giant leap into a void. We execute a tactical move forward in full knowledge of who it is that we serve. Because we're not serving and our faith is not an uninformed faith. And if you see from the beginning, there has not been an uninformed faith. God has been interacting and teaching and showing and guiding his people throughout all of his story, all of history. There's a significance, there's an importance to John's call to repentance. And why it is that from the very beginning, both the people of this world and those that are theologically faulty hate that call. Is there really any a surprise any surprise that repentance is maligned or ignored in modern America? That a lot of the squishy evangelical Christians that are around us will say, well, you know, they're mistakes and everybody makes mistakes. Uh, there's actually even this whole idea that the only ones that really need to repent are those that are coming to Christ. And then after that, you're, you're good, you're gravy. You don't have any need for that. But the reality presented to us in the scriptures that has been echoed by great theologians throughout history is that we spend every moment of our lives repenting. There's a reason why John said in 1 John that if we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us our trespasses. There's a reason why we have instructions on praying specifically and that in the Lord's Prayer, as the instruction manual for how we are to pray, we ask for forgiveness as we have been forgiven, as we forgive our debtors. We forgive our debtors just as we have been forgiven. And we've talked about this before, how we don't just willy-nilly, to use biblical language, prostitute or whore out our forgiveness. We don't just give it out. We don't just give it to people who do not repent. That is not what the Word of God teaches us. Forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. How are our debts forgiven? We repent. We go to the Lord and we say, Father, forgive me. I have sinned in this way. I continue to sin in this way. Father, I am so weak. Father, I am not reading. I am not doing as I am supposed to. Forgive me for your son's sake. We have it in our prayer for this week. That thing that we don't mention, that heavy weight of sin should be what we should mention. And it is repentance that is most disliked by the people of this world. They don't want to repent. They want to be able to feel good about themselves. They don't want to exist in a world where, you know what, you are unclean and you are before a clean and holy, thrice holy God. And the only way that you can be in communion with such a holy God is through sacrifice. And that sacrifice was paid by Jesus Christ. So, let's look at these people. Let's look at Tiberius Caesar, at Pontius Pilate, at Herod, at Philip, at Licinius, and then look at Annas and Caiaphas, these people, and come to see exactly what's going on. We have a historical introduction. We have several important people in Roman and Jewish authority. These are leaders. We have Tiberius Caesar. We have Pontius Pilate. We have Herod. We have Philip and Licinius. And then we have these two high priests. And that should have alarm bells going off because there should only be one high priest at any point in time. Well, what does that say about the environment. And we've talked about it before when we were in John. We've talked about it several other times. It shows how absolutely careless the people and authority, Jewish authority, got to being. The, the, the historical context that we have gives us 
two things for us to bear in mind. It serves a dual purpose. And I'm going to mention both of them and then I'll flush them out a little bit. The first is it reminds us that these events are not, and I've already mentioned that, they're not mythological. It's not a made-up story. And these, these events happened within time and in space, and then what we have here provides a framework of something that happened in real human history. These people really were rulers at this time, and you can take that to the bank. You can go and look up, hey, when was Tiberius Caesar? When was this guy? When was Philip? When were these people in leadership in these specific areas? When was Tiberius Caesar or and Pontius Pilate, a governor of Judah. When was Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee? Where was his brother? When, when was his brother Philip, the Tetrarch of the reg region of Iteria and Trachonitis? When was Licinius, the Tetrarch of Abilene? When did this happen? And you can find this information and see, you know what, this, this actually happened. These people are real. The, these events actually happened. All right, so that's the first part. We have these truths well documented, providing a clear timeline for the events that Luke is describing for us so that our faith can be properly grounded in truth and not having our feet planted in midair as the evolutionists do, believing in, in the Big Bang Fairy and how it is that she made everything psh, explode one day at a random Thursday afternoon by lighting the, the wonderful powder keg of everything that was there? No. That's not what happened. Secondly, the mention of these rulers who represent both the secular and the religious powers set the stage, right? They, they give us the contrast that we have been talking about all along, darkness and light. These are the dark, and we see the light coming as John the Baptist stepped forward. Let us not forget the words of our Lord. Speaking of John, he was a burning and shining light. Christ said that. So this isn't just, oh, hey, pastor's making up themes here. No, no, these themes are real. They're in the Word. And it's important for us to realize... Okay, if John was the light, then everything else around John at that time was in darkness. And only one of these is operating according to the authority of God. It's not any of the secular authorities, and it wasn't the religious authorities of the time. Think about this. Augustus Caesar was no longer the emperor of Rome as he was at the time of Jesus. So we have that, right? Caesar Augustus during the birth of Jesus. Well, he's not there. Now we have the emperor Tiberius. Now, there's a change there in space and in time. Pilate was the fifth governor named by Roman emperors to rule over the conquered Palestine. Again, another historical fact that you can find out. And the Herod that was mentioned here is not Herod the Great. The Herod here is Herod Antipas. A different Herod, because, hey, Herods are a popular name. Another reality that you can find out. This is Herod Antipas, who replaced his brother, Archelaus. I don't expect you to be able to write these names down with any kind of adequate spelling accuracy. These are names that are difficult anyhow. Archelaus was the first appointed tetrarch over Judea and Samaria. But he was deposed by the Roman emperor, guess for what? For being too cruel. Think about that in light of what we have in scripture. Of Herod the Mad, or Herod the Great as he's known. The Roman Empire, though it was known for its cruelty saw the brutality of Archelaus and said, no, nope, no, no, we don't, we don't need your kind of brutality here. You're disturbing the order we want to establish. They threw him out of office, and in came this Herod, Herod Antipas. 
Philip, who was restored, it was he who restored the ancient city and then named the city after himself and Caesar. That's where we get Caesarea Philippi. This guy named that place. And he was one of the most notable rulers or one of the most noble rulers of the Jews at that time. Now, moving on to the religious leaders. Israel only had one high priest at any given point in time. The word of God is absolutely clear on this. When the high priest, I mean, it played into an important reality. Hey, if you're in a sanctuary city, you can't leave. You accidentally killed someone. You were out there with your scythe, chopping down some corn or some barley, something, right? And for whatever reason, that bit of scythe came out and went and hit your neighbor and he bled to death. You could only be in that sanctuary city so long. And you were hoping that you could get to it, one, and two, that the high priest was old. Because you couldn't leave that place and return safely to your place until the death of the high priest. It would have been utter chaos with two high priests. Especially when we know that one was older and one was younger. But we also see here that, and this is an again, right? I want us to be able to think about things. There's a lot of talk like, hey, you know, at this point, the Jews didn't have any more idols. They'd learned their lesson. Well, maybe. They definitely didn't set up for themselves any graven image, any carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below the earth. That's, that's true. But I think we, as modern Christians, understand that not all idol, idols are made of wood and stone, right? Or of precious metals. That there are idols of one's own invention of the mind that are true. And that people can idolize political figures or a political government. I mean, we just need to see all of those people that have made uh, former President Trump basically another Christ. That is blasphemy and idolatry all in one go. And yet here we have the people that are supposed to be in leadership, the high priest, allowing himself to be deposed, say, yeah, hey, we don't need you uh, as the high priest. We're actually going to pick your relative, Annas, to be the high priest. But I mean, you can stay as, as high priest also, but he's going to be our main high priest. That's basically what the Roman government did. They said, you know what, you're, you're not going to be our main guy. We're going to have this guy be our guy. But both of you, as far as the Jews are going to be concerned, are the high priest. That's why when Christ is taken in, after being in the garden, he's taken first to Caiaphas and then to Annas. Because there was two high priests. That's also the reason why Paul didn't know who the high priest was. So that when he was struck by the high priest, he actually said, hey, you whitewashed tomb. And then had to correct himself. Uh, you, you revile the Lord's high priest. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know he was the high priest. That wasn't just ignorance. It's you couldn't even keep track anymore because the leadership had given themselves to the idolatry of the political system. We talked about this last time. How it is that they'd gotten to the point of saying, we'll lose our place and our nation. We're going to lose everything good we have. Okay, well, you know what? We can capitulate a little bit here. We can give way a little bit here. It's fine. It's fine. If they want to have this other person as our high priest, we know who our high priest is. And well, since they have us do the whole ceremony, they're forcing us to do the whole ceremony, uh, we'll just hold them both as high priests, uh, even if it's contrary to what God is. And you see, that's the important part. It is contrary to what God had said. God had said there was to be one high priest, and they went away from that and were doing what men commanded them to do. Capitulation. 
It's just one other little factor that goes to show how far removed they were from true faith and obedience to God. And when you look at the American landscape of evangelicalism, you see the very same thing. Capitulation here, capitulation there, a little pragmatism over here. Hey, if it works, don't knock it. Right? So what if the fog machine is a little cliche? So what if the glitter dust coming out of the vents is a little overboard? So what if we've got people going out to the cemetery and lying down on the graves of, you know, supposedly faithful Christians to absorb some kind of religious power? As long as we have more people filling the places, we're winning. No. There is a holiness without which God will not be seen. There is a reason why from the beginning... Our Lord said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I command? It's important. It's important for us to evaluate the landscape around us and to see that it's not always going to be some huge thing that's supposed to throw out alarms or red flags. It sometimes is these little capitulations all adding up to idolizing something. Or someone. We talked about within the first couple of years of me becoming pastor here of how we are not to idolize the pastor. And how that was all the way back in the scriptures. Paul and Apollos or Cephas. Who do you follow? Well, you're supposed to follow Christ. Pastor so and so is not the definition of that. Not myself, not Aaron. And yet we've seen how when that has happened and some pastor decides, you know what, I think I see greener pastors in Mobile, Alabama because they're going to pay me more. It has torn apart congregations. Pastors who do not care for anything but funds, for pastors who do not care for the sheep, and sheep who do not do, as Hebrews says, making the lives of the shepherds who hold accountability for their souls responsible. We have all of this already there. Leadership who doesn't care for the people. We know they denigrated them enough to say, are you like these simpletons? Are you falling sway to this as well? at least among themselves. Here are these powerful figures, and yet the word of God doesn't come to any one of them. This is important. The word of God did not come to any of these people. The word of God did not come to the high priest. Well, which high priest? Well, it didn't come to either high priest. And it's not like one was more holy than the other. The word of God did not come to any of the religious elites. The word of God came to a man who was isolated from it all in the wilderness. And that's another theme that we have to bear in mind. We talk about how this place right here is an oasis for us. We've also referred to this place as the training ground, right? The, the training camp for the Christian soldiers that will be marching as to war, right? But we also have to realize that this is also a place, a wilderness of sorts, where we have the oasis, where we isolate ourselves for a moment, for a day, for an hour. From the world and from the ways of the world. There, there was a reason why John was a man who was dressed as he was dressed, who ate what? Wild locusts and honey. Right? He wasn't attached to the delicacies of the world. The man was eating bugs okay, and honey. This was not a man who could be swayed by any fig cakes. And this was not a man who could be swayed by sweet tarts. This was not a man that could be swayed by delicious banquets being held in his honor. The guy had lived a life of rigid asceticism 
setting himself apart unto the Lord, being away from even the community until the Lord, the word of the Lord, came to him. Until then, he was there. And we need to consider, where are we prior to doing work for the Lord? Because if you never distance yourself from this world, you're not going to succeed. If you're so much in the stuff that everybody else is in and not in the word of God, not isolating yourself, not giving yourself any time to be alone, right? You're not going to succeed. You know, we talk about the spiritual disciplines often. Prayer, fasting, the communion of saints. But you know which one we don't really talk about a whole lot? Solitude. We don't talk about solitude as one of the spiritual disciplines. And the proper application of solitude for prayer, solitude for fasting. If you read the Puritans, there are instructions even for large families. Husbands, if you, if you need to, so that you can properly spend this time of prayer and fasting before the Lord, go to your closet. Wives, go for this time of prayer and fasting to your room. Children, stay in your room for this amount of time in prayer, in fasting, and then come together for singing of psalms, for the reading of God's word, and for the prayers of family worship. You've got such a hyper-individualistic society that believes that they are Superman going out there thinking that they can win their wives, win their husbands to Christ, and win their family members when they have never fed themselves spiritually, have never read the whole word of God even once in their entire lifetime. Think about where we were as a congregation just seven years ago. Pastor Aaron wasn't here then. Otherwise, it would have been more than just myself who had read the Word of God once over or more at that point in time. Since then, we can joyfully say we have read every year. That's why we have a Bible reading plan for the congregation. I still remember when our sister Pam praised the Lord for the fact that she had read, oh, I thank the Lord, this is the first time I've read it as a whole. And it was because we were able to encourage each other to do so. But how many Christians think that they can do it on their own? No, we were not meant to isolate ourselves permanently. The word of God comes to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, we know what that word was. Go, preach. He went into all the region. Here in verse 3. He went into all the region around the Jordan. And what did he proclaim? A baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. It is absolutely contrary to the way that people would have thought then. Hey, you're a son or daughter of Abraham. You're already one of the elect. What need do you have to clean yourself before the Lord arrives? And think of how many Christians nowadays think the same thing. What need do I have to strive after holiness? I've got my get out of hell free ticket already. I went up, I prayed a prayer, and I was dunked. X, Y, Z years. And since then, haven't done anything for the Lord at all have not grown in any legitimate way. All we have to do is see what the Word of God says. Is there place for ignorance? Is there place for not knowing things? Yes, there is. But there is no place for a permanence of that reality. We are to always be growing in some way, shape, or form. Now, the Lord didn't make all of us equal of mind. The Lord didn't give all of us the ability to retain information the exact same way. But the Lord did give his word to all of us and say that his word is profitable for teaching, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for exhortation, is proper for leading our lives in godliness. It is profitable in every way. John comes and he 
says, you must repent of your sins and you must take the ritual of baptism that you have been applying to proselytes. You know how you've been going to like those dirty people, the, the, the Gentiles, and you know, in order for them to be like us, they have to wash themselves ceremonially say, hey, you know what, I'm too filthy on my own, and in order to me, for me to be around y'all clean people, I need to wash myself? Uh, no, you need to wash yourself. You need to repent. There needs to be an internal and an external washing. What is repentance? It's one of our catechism questions. Repentance is a turning away from sin, not just a turning away from sin, right? With all hatred, with all disgust, with all repulsion of that sin. You find that sin disgusting. You hate it. You want it as far away from you as possible. And a turning to God. You want nothing but His holiness. You want nothing but His love. You want nothing but His grace. You want nothing but Him. Every moment of every day. The masses receive the message well. But the leaders did not. Repentance, in biblical terms, involves a complete change in mind and in heart. It's, it's a recognition of one's sinfulness. It's a recognition of one's need for God's mercy. There's a reason why Christ used the example of that man. Lord, be merciful to me, a child of Abraham. No. One of the people of the tribe. Of, no. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And then there's a whole study there. Pastor Aaron has talked about the fact that there's a mercy seat language there and the, the Old Testament implications of the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat of the Lord and how the man was basically saying, Lord, be the mercy seat to me. Be the propitiation, the forgiveness. Be th because I'm a sinner. That, that's what it is to repent. And John shows up and says, you need to do this. You need to repent. There needs to be a real recognition. A real recognition. A real change because repentance without change is not repentance. That's your internal. And then you have the external. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Be baptized so that you can symbolize, hey, I, I really have. And you would. You would. I don't know if you have had this, but I have. There have been moments in my life where I have sinned against the Lord and I have felt that not even a good, hot shower, hours long, would be enough to make me feel like I'm in any way cleaner. And of course, the fact is, it isn't. A shower isn't. It's just an external thing. We know that what is important, as John said, is the Lamb the Lamb of God, whose blood is the forgiveness. John's baptism was an outward sign of an inward change. Sound familiar? It's the very same for us. Our baptism is an outward sign of an inward change, symbolizing the washing away of sin, the commitment to living a new life, in obedience to God. This is why they came to him and said, I, I've, I've been baptized, I've been cleaned. What can I do now? I need instruction. I hate this sin. I've repented of it. How can I live in a way that I can prepare the way for the Lord? Right? The call was, 
is and will be until the day the Lord comes. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have that in Matthew 4, 17. The call to repentance isn't just a call for recognition of your filthiness. It's also a reminder. And it comes with the promise of forgiveness. It comes with, okay, who am I repenting to? And how can I be forgiven? The very same words of the men who listened to Peter preach. What must we do? What must we do to be saved? What must we do? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As John does this, as he goes and heralds repentance, he fulfills the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And we've talked about this before. So for those of us that have been here for more than a couple of years, this will be a repass, but it's still going to be good in its content enough that for those that haven't been here, there's a little bit of new information, right? Every valley shall be filled where there is lacking, right? There is God lifting up. God lifting up the humble. Those that are low, right? You're in the valley. God is going to lift you up. Those that are haughty, every mountain. And how haughty can you be? Well, you can be as haughty and as high up on your own self-importance as a mountain, or you can be as haughty and self-important as a hill. And we all know hills, right? We live in this part of Iowa. We see hills all the time. But if you go to other parts of the U.S. and you see what hills are from a ge geological perspective, those things are gigantic. I don't know how they can call that hills, but it makes these things look like mounds around here, okay? So what is this? There's, there's the symbological, right, language that is happening here. Those that are lowly, those that humble themselves will be lifted up. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain, every haughty person, right? John the Baptist said it clearly. The axe is laid at the root of the tree. And if you're haughty, you're going to get struck down and sent to the fire. They're already, from the very beginning, there is repentance. And if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. Have you repented? Great. Know that in your lowly condition, God will bring you up. This is a part of preparing the way for the Lord. The Lord will lift you up in your humility. You don't have to do it yourself. You don't lift yourself up. God will do that work within you as you remain obedient and humble. If you think you can do it, God will bring you down. Every mountain, every hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight. Hey, are you off? theologically, but you're humble, guess what? You'll be straightened out. Because that humility will help you bow the knee every single time to the Word of God. Every single time that the Word of God says, hey, this is not the way you're supposed to do it. This is not how you interact with a relative who has turned their back and spat on the Lord. This is not how you interact with worldly people. This is not how you interact with Christians. Every crooked way. And the crooked shall become straight. The rough places shall become level ways. And if you remember when we talked about this now three years ago, we talked about how the path that is envisioned here is so smooth, so straight, so level that you could walk on it barefoot and never once Stub your toe on any rock, any protrusion, nothing. It is the perfect straightening out of the way of the Lord. The rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Do you see how all of these things put together show 
they highlight absolutely clearly that contrast. There are mountains, there are hills, there are those people that have elevated themselves against the Lord and against His anointed that say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cord from us, right? That's a little throwback to Wednesday and last Wednesday. These are biblical truths. And it's really hard for people to say, yeah, and that's the religious leaders. Or for Americans to say, yeah, but that was back then. It's not happening now. And then a little book comes out that shows exactly how crooked American Christianity is and can back it up with documents. So-called Christian leaders taking millions of dollars given in good love toward the Lord and absolutely using them for their own glory and for the own, their own honor. We have the same environment. That has not changed. Any Christian at any point in history can look around and see these realities until that sun dashes them into pieces. Until all enemies have been laid at his feet for us. Because that's already happened. Our Lord said, all authority and dominion has been given to me. Where? In heaven and on earth. On earth and in heaven. We're just slowly seeing that actualized in time and in space. It was a message of urgency. Do this and do it now. And it's the same message we have. Prepare the way of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And how are you able to seek him? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for his kingdom is at hand. This is the same urgent message that John had. It's the same urgent message that Christians throughout the generations have had. And it's a message we need to own. We need to own this in our homes. We need to own this message in our families. We need to own this message within this community and within this nation. And we need to be willing to bow our knee to the scripture and to follow through with what the word of God says as regards every one of those spheres. We close with the words of Paul to the Philippians. In Philippians 4, verse 6, as we consider the weight of these truths upon us, the weight of the call to go and to do, to obey the Lord. May you be encouraged by these words. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And all of his people said, Amen.